And welcome to another Wolf of the Crows interview special. We are fucking coming out of nowhere with these, man. Sticking fucking fast with interviews. Um, we've come to realise that everybody's in lockdown and they have nothing better to do. So let's get them fucking interviewed. It's easy, it's easy to get a hold of them these days. Tactics. And as usual, guys, hey, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to this video. Now, who we've got... Um, this week, I mean, this is Game of Thrones fucking royalty. Game of Thrones legendary status shit right here. We have none other than Multos Yeralmu. I hope I said a second name correctly there. Send it uh, right. What? Send it right. Well, there we go. I took a, 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 who, of course, plays Siri O'Farrell on uh, Game of Thrones. Um, are you a regular on the end? A regular on the uh, convention circuit. Oh, the fucking Jesus, boy! You can't get him away from the conventions, boys. He loves him. Um, but yeah, um, Arya Stark's dancing master from season one. Um, so, you know, even in the later seasons, you always remember who Sergio Farrell is. You know, perfectly portrayed by Meltos. So we contacted him. We interviewed him. Here you go. Yeah. Balar Mogulis, and welcome to another exclusive Wolf and the Crows interview, bringing you interviews from the stars of Game of Thrones. And today, guys, we have a stalwart member of the Game of Thrones cast, and that is, of course, of course Miltos Yoralamu. Did I get it right? Yes, you did, my friend. Awesome. You did, yeah. It's a good start when I, whenever I can get the names right. And of course, Milto's here playing um, Cyril Farrell, uh, Dancing Master um, from Game of Thrones. So, Milto's, how are you, man? It's an absolute pleasure to have you. How are you? I'm doing okay. Yeah, considering everything, I'm doing really okay. Surviving? I'm well. I'm, yeah, I'm staying safe. So, yeah, I'm doing okay. Excellent, man. Nice one. Always good to hear. Happy days. And um, what do you call what's uh, going on with you at the, um, well, let's, i tell you what, before the coronavirus happened, uh, what were you up to? Uh, I literally had, had done one week of rehearsals for a play at the Royal Court in London, at the Royal mm -hmm. Court Theatre in London, and managed to get through one week of rehearsals. Mm -hmm. um and then we can and then we we shut the show down because of obviously we we you know all the theaters in london decided to pull the plug plug on their their productions uh or as we were realizing what was going on um and at the moment it's in uh it's postponed until we know what's going to be happening as far as you know people being able to sit in close proximity to each other in a small enclosed space so um the play was um two uh two palestinians go dogging um written by an amazing young writer called uh, sammy ibrahim uh brilliant i mean really it's very rare you get to i mean the, the play is is um the, the title itself is is eye-catching but the play itself is really is really special so i really hope we get to do it because uh, it's very rare you get to read a play that really you find surprising, but this is. I mean, it's about Palestinian-Israeli relationships. Uh, it felt very pertinent uh, for the times we we're living in, and um, but very surprising and not what you expect. I have I have done theatre myself and read a lot of through my studies and stuff. I've read a lot of plays. Never has Dogen been in. <laughs> <laughs> If it was my yeah. whole academic side of my <laughs> learning about theatre would have been a lot more interesting. That's awesome, man. Yeah. So, re really, you're um, you were in theatre. Uh, so, you would primarily uh, you would primarily do a lot more theatre than you would do TV. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, my background is theatre. My uh, my experience is theatre. I love theatre. Mm -hmm. I love doing TV and film, but it's very, very different. So yes. um, uh, there's a lot more theatre as well mm -hmm. than TV and film work. Um, but I was I was really uh, feeling incredibly privileged and lucky to be able to um, span all those different mediums. I even do opera as well. So that, mm -hmm. that's also 
part of my repertoire. So, um, so yeah, uh, I I feel very very lucky that I, I you know in my latter part of my career I was managing to to really do um, all the things I wanted to do really, which is which I feel incredibly privileged to to be able to do. Awesome. And with your actual theatrical well, uh, th theatrical training and stuff like this, would do, before you uh, even came onto the set of Game of Thrones, had you done a uh, lot of stage combat, a lot of sword work on stage before? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was part of the uh what they ask for when they would when you know when they send you the breakdown the agent sends you the breakdown from from the casting directors about what what the character is like what they're looking for in the actor who's going up for it um it said uh must be a competent swordsman yes. and i i used to i used to i used to laugh at that because uh and i still to this day was like so what does that mean because uh they wanted someone who was like a little bit more proficient than just the stuff you learn at uh, theatre school, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, either that's a professional swordsman, which sounds illegal nowadays, yeah. or they wanted a sports fencer or, you know, someone who does it, you know, a sporting uh, fencer or martial artist. Um, I was neither of those things, uh, but I had worked a lot at the Royal Shakespeare, Shakespeare Company with uh, lots of different fight choreographers. And I have a background as a dancer, so that's where the opera comes in. When I, when I first started acting, I worked at the English National Opera and managed to blag my way into a Jonathan Miller production of Carmen, where I learned how to do the tango. And then I ended up being employed as a dancer and was waiting for someone to tap me on the shoulder going, hang on a minute, you are not a dancer <laughs> and i never had ex i never had extensive training Aye. i was like i was just someone who was very competent at you know i have one of those brains that i can process choreography and i can then replicate it yeah um and i always love doing it you know i've always loved dance i love watching dance i love i love all of that stuff so um i had worked with and, and you know dance choreography fight choreography it kind of works in the same way you know people teach you a certain way of moving and you just interpret it and um and so i'd worked with some fantastic fight choreographers and so when they asked me in the audition you know did i have experience i i felt like i could honestly say yes without feeling like i was fibbing or lying yeah. you know so uh -huh. Great. I remember I actually I studied um, with the British Academy of Dramatic Combat over in Exeter and um, the two people that came top of the class were uh, a ballet dancer, um, female ballet dancer and a female hip hop coach. Um, they were, well, there you go. They, they needed to be shown things once and I'm like writing things down, you know, and all this type of stuff and like I think my problem was that I had come to study stage combat but i had already been studying hema historical european martial arts yeah which of course. Is totally different you know so i had to work that out of my system you know but yeah, yeah. dancers yeah yeah dancers are just the the best at it um so i'll start off with the very first question now because that was that was just a bit of small talk there how did you land the role of of serio farrell on game of thrones so uh, I was, I am lucky enough to know Nina Gold. Uh, she, um, she'd been someone who had followed my career since I, I'd, be, I'd, I'd first started kind of acting professionally around 1994. Um, seems such a long time ago now. And, 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 and she, <laughs> and she, um, I still think like, 2020 2000s were like uh, 10 years ago <laughs> so um i so she had followed my career she was she you know she's one of those i mean the reason why she's such a brilliant casting director is that she does the legwork right she she goes and sees people in shows and not just the west end shows and the national she goes to small pub theaters in the middle of nowhere and she goes and you know sees mm -hmm. what's going on and, and so mm -hmm. she always has had her ear to the ground and then when she got the gig of doing game of thrones by the way <gasps> this is louis oh louis 
Hey, he is. And this is Louis. He always oh, makes an appearance. Oh, he's um, uh, um, so, so when it came to casting Game of Thrones, of course, they were looking at pretty much all the, the British uh, actors that were around at the time. Uh-huh. Um, and she got in touch with my agent. She sent through the part of uh, Lord Varys. It was a scene where he goes to see uh, Eddard Stark in the cells yes. and tells him to take the black and to kind of just 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 say you're sorry, you didn't mean it, you know. Um, and it's a great scene and it's fantastic. You know, Conleth in that in the in the first season, that, that scene is so fantastic, that scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a great scene to do. And I think one of the things, and I I, we were, I was doing um a, like an online virtual convention and, and Ross Mulland, um uh, who I've worked with quite a lot, as well as he, he played a White Walker in the first season of, um, of Game of Thrones. He reminded uh, me of of that, and James Cosmo reminded me of that. That you know, when you got the scripts through, when you got the sides through that you were going to read for the audition, they were really, really good, so well written. You know, and sometimes you you get these these scenes that you have to learn for a, for a casting and. You know they're pretty ropey. Yeah. <laughs> you can always tell because they're really hard to learn. Uh-huh. But th- these scenes were fantastic, and that scene particularly, and it just kind of you just connected with it immediately. So I read that um, they liked it, but they didn't think I was right for the part, and that's when they sent me uh, the role of Syria Pharrell. And it was the first lesson with Arya Stark, and mm. that's a three and a half minute scene, and I had to learn the whole of it for the audition. And Robert Stern, who was her assistant, uh, read it, read Aria for, with with me, and he was brilliant as Aria. And um, and I I swear to this day that he is the one who got me that job because he was he read so well with me. Yeah. And um, and yeah, and I did that about five times over and over the same scene over and over again, um, until uh, you know hbo and david and dan the creators of game of thrones came over from america to meet us all in person and that's when we realized we were you know this close to getting it or losing it Mm. that's when you really crap yourself yeah Um, and uh they got me to read it in several different accents in my in my own accent in an rp in different foreign accents um and then a couple of days later, they said I'd got it. So that was like pretty amazing. And I remember you go you go to a, a casting um, and uh, there's a particular casting house in Soho that you go to regularly as an actor. And the guy who operates the camera, this young guy, he was so, he knew Game of Thrones. None of us knew anything about Game of Thrones, but he was really excited about this. And when he knew that I'd got it, he was so excited and I've never seen, uh, a, a, a guy who works in those studios ever excited because he sees people go in and out all day long doing castings but he was really excited about yeah. it you could tell that it was something special because he was he was really excited yeah um did you after getting the role decide to maybe read into the books or did you just to see so he was and serial on the books. I I read I read the first book uh, in preparation for the audition actually, so I'd already read read it because mm. I'm I'm not very thorough in <laughs> most of the things I do in my life, but when it comes to preparing for work, I I yeah I thought I'd do my homework. Oh, uh-huh. uh, and I and I read I read I read the book and I really liked it and um um so I did read I did read the book. In fact, I ended up reading the first three books. Yeah, um, and I did. I really enjoyed them. I, I really yeah. did enjoy them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's one thing I, if I remember correctly about Sirio's character in the book. Uh, he has a bald head, and he tends to clack his book nose. Yeah, and tends to clack his teeth. And I always thought to myself, if they made Miltos do that, that would really take after teeth, take after take a clack in your teeth. So I'm glad they didn't make you do I that. Up, I ended up doing a little kind of tut tut instead of the clacking. Uh, I, oh, I, uh, yeah. Oh, we all remember that one. Big time, yeah. Um, so you continued to watch Game of Thrones after did you had left the show, and you continued to watch. You've watched all eight seasons. Yeah, I was a fa- I was a real fan. I would watch it avidly. I would watch it as soon as it would come out. 
Mm-hmm. I sometimes even downloaded it when I because I didn't have HBO or Sky at the time, so I I thought you know there I was not really allowed. But it, but even HBO were like I oh, whatever. <laughs> but um but yeah I was I was um I I was a real fan and I of course I was a big fan of all stuff in King's Landing because mm. I like the the politics the politics of the of the show I really enjoyed the most I think the machinations the backstabbing mm. the 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 you know the pursuit of power and you know that that was that was thrilling all of that stuff and of course Arya Stark's uh, storyline I really really liked so. That was my next question, actually. Um, but just before I jump onto that, just the way you said about the uh, downloads of Game of Thrones, um, uh, Australia holds the record. And like I used to, I used to love taking, um, making fun of Australian tourists that got on my bus because they hold the record for the world's most, you know, most illegally down, downloaded episodes of Game of Thrones. Really. Uh, yeah, they do. Now the whole problem with that was is because they didn't get Game of Thrones for a year after we would get it. You can't expect, but you can't take a show like this, you know. But like I used to say to all the Australians, um, no wonder. Sure, Australia used to be a penal colony. The <laughs> <Not> much changes. <laughs> <laughs> Just get a laugh at them, all right? Like you know, awesome, crack. But, um, You're not wrong. <laughs> exactly. Um, so that leads on because I already knew the answer to this, Emily. Um, but what's your favorite? Uh, who's your favorite character, and what is your favorite scene from the entire eight seasons of Game of Thrones? My favorite character. That's kind of hard because there's so many that you like for different reasons. But I think I will always keep coming back to Jamie Lannister. Oh, Jamie Lannister, okay. Yeah, because I remember, I think it was season two, where he's captured Mm -hmm. by Caitlin Mm -hmm. and Rob, and he's in the cell, and they send a Lannister, maybe his cousin or something, or his nephew or something, to, to plead with him or something, and he kills him. Yeah. And I was so shocked by that. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, it's, that's kind of where I really took notice of that character. And then, of course, in season three, or no, three, I mean, all, no, I haven't lost a track of time, when he has his hand cut off, mm-hmm. again, another, it's so shocking. And, and the, 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 the transformation of that character, like the, the, the journey of that character was so thrilling to watch that I couldn't quite um, take my, and also because Nikolai did such a fantastic job of portraying that character. Mm -hmm. I I just think uh, uh, for me, it was just, it was so good. And his performance, the way that that character was written and Mm -hmm. how his story played out, um, I found really compelling. And and I, I love characters like Bronn and uh, Tyrion and of course you know Arya Stark mm-hmm. and the cat and the actors who portrayed them uh, amazing but I think just for pure drama uh, surprise mm-hmm. and just character development development it has to be Jamie Lannister the one thing about Jamie Lannister for me always was was like I'd read the books a long time before the show came out um, but I remember like reading about Jimmy Lannister and him turning up at the very, very first time and I'm going, right, number one, he's good looking. Number two, he's blonde. I hate this guy already. Um, <laughs> number three, he's a complete asshole. And number four, he's doing that with his sister, right? And I'm going, I hate this guy, but he is one of my favourite characters. And it's almost like the whole moniker of Kingslayer. He had no choice <laughs> to kill the king, you know? And like, Lord Eddard Stark, who is one of the most noblest characters in the show, I think is wrong to chastise him for it in season one. It's such a multi, you know, and the way you say he kills uh, Alton, Sir Alton Lannister, who is his cousin, okay, okay. strangles him, um, or, and then beats him around the head in the, the cell. Um, so someone will come to look, and then he can escape. Um, 
which just shows to me he's he'll kill his own he'll kill his own lesser family member just to get back to his sister how you yeah, yeah, yeah. sister that's amazing yeah. amazing yeah. there's such a brilliant story i love jamie's the entire way through it was fantastic yeah, yeah. awesome i wasn't i was actually expecting are you but um, I see she's always my go-to anyway but I know, yeah uh, jamie is just He's he's far more interesting. In I mean, Aria is very interesting, and also remember that you know even her j journey was very complicated because you know you're not supposed to enjoy her revenge, and any other kind of story that it deals with revenge is that's kind of the the thing you're aching for is for them to 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 do the revenge, mm -hmm. but as she gets deeper and deeper into hers, mm -hmm. things get more and more complicated, and she loses herself and she changes. And, and again, that was really handled really well because that was that was uh, surprising and unexpected. And like, kind of that's the best part of Game of Thrones is that you never really know where these stories go, and that's what made it so compelling. Why you couldn't yeah. stop watching it. Brilliant, man! Fantastic. Um, so, oh, uh, very interested in this question here. Where did you get the inspiration for your sweet Bravosi accent? <laughs> <laughs> My sweet Bravosi accent. Oh. Um, <laughs> um, it's quite funny, really, because it, it's basically it's me doing an impersonation of my dad. I, well, he's got it from because I would say that you, your family loves it in Cyprus. Your mom and dad are in the Cyprus. Greek Cypriots, yeah. Yeah, and then um, how long have you been in London? Oh, I was born, just bought. I was literally, my mum was heavily pregnant when she was on a boat uh, heading from Cyprus to Southampton in 1960. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember. 1967. <laughs> Okay. I was born in 1968, and um, I and I, I was late. So my the plan was that I was going to be born at sea, so that she could choose um, my nationality. She really wanted to go to America, but she couldn't because okay. her father was one of the guys who painted a bit of the Golden Gate Bridge, and so and unfortunately, my mum never has never been to America, and maybe she's too old now to. She keeps saying she's too old to go now. But um, she always wanted to go. And um, I think that was part of her plan. But I, I disappointed her as, as I have done for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 uh, so we ended up in England. But uh, I was just born in England. Yeah, just conceived right. in Cyprus, born in England. And that's pretty much, you just got, you picked and so yeah. And so just to finish the thing about the accent, uh, it, it was, of course, it began with my my with my dad's with my dad's accent doing the impersonation of my dad, which is the easiest thing to my ear. Um, at, but then, of course, I I kind of mixed it up with a bit of Spanish and Italian and pushed it into the Middle East, you know, the Persian kind of the overly rolled R's, which I to this day I regret. But hey, no, you know, <laughs> no, I mean, hindsight is a. There's one thing you know from coming as a book reader and then you know coming in and watching the show and hearing i remember you like the first time you i was just all that's that's exactly what sario pharrell sounds like but i've never heard him before but that is what he sounds like you know what i mean i just thought it was just perfect for it absolutely i was perfect. very lucky in the sense that the way that george R. R. martin wrote uh, him, you know, with that kind of wonderfully um, idiosyncratic, you know, uh, speech patterns. Yes. Which was kind of just lifted from the books, was so helpful, you know. It's like, you know, it's got that kind of Yoda thing going on, which is really uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. slightly back to front. Yeah. Calling Ari a boy all the time, you know, that, that really helped as well. So yeah. the writing was really good. Fantastic, man. Um, what was your favourite thing about working on Game of Thrones? If you could pick one thing. Well, my, my scenes were very limited to, to working with Maisie Williams. Mm. But I have to say, working with Maisie Williams, okay. even then, she was a 13-year-old uh, child who had never acted before. Imagine that. No, no. Was a revelation. Because uh, I say this all the time when I talk about working with her. 
that that you know I've worked with a lot of amazing amazing actors on stage and on TV and film and the thing about actors and and the more experience you get like like you look at someone like Judy Dench she's fantastic because she's so effortless she's got to a place where uh, she um, she she doesn't have to try too mm-hmm. hard right she's done the work and she she understands herself and understands what she can do to such an extent that she just lets it happen and that is why she's such a fantastic actress mm-hmm. um i suffer a little bit from being a little bit over analytical about my performances so, oh, so I, I so that self-consciousness is something i always have to work very hard at mm-hmm. um and so the, the 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 point that you want to get to is where you're not thinking about what you're doing you're not uh, you've done the homework you've done the work and then you literally try and put yourself in a place of pure relaxation which for me is so difficult so if you ever watch me on 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 uh, you know even playing Syria when i watch some of those scenes sometimes and i look completely at ease and at re- at, at, at relax and and super confident i guarantee you inside i was like <laughs> and this it's all an act for that thing of just remaining calm so that's the thing that I work really hard at. So when you work with someone like Maisie, who has no experience, has nothing to bring except just being in the moment, being present and just, you know, reacting, that's the place you want to be. And so working with someone like that, who has the confidence mm-hmm. uh, just to be present, you learn a lot. And, very you know, broad, you could tell um, that she was going to be very, very good. Yeah, mm-hmm. even at that age, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. And I, I just think it, because what you've told me there about Nina, Gold, uh, casting director. Um, I really like what you said there about her not just going to the big theatres and going to the smaller ones and finding hidden gems. And one of the things she she was amazing at um, was finding the children. I mean, yeah, yeah, just every kid that has actually appeared in Game of Thrones has been amazing. And I've been on set with them and. I remember, like Bella Ramsey, Leanna Mormont, for example. Yeah, amazing, I mean, amazing. We shot that scene over two days, and um, like some of the main actors are only human, obviously, and sometimes they get tongue tied and asked to go again. I mean, sh- over the two days, never, never asked, you know, can all kind of go again or anything. She's just on the ball all the time, you know. Yeah, it's fantastic. One of the best things about the show for me was the casting, you know, it's brilliant. Um, so whenever you were over shooting season one uh, in Belfast, what was your favorite thing about Belfast? Well, it was my very first time I'd ever spent any time in Belfast. So I'd never visited before. So for me, it was literally discovering just how amazing Belfast was. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I know it's kind of, it's such a, a you know, everyone says it but the people seriously i'd never i mean it, everyone you know I, I i don't want to sound like i you know like every oh, don't, don't uh, worry. actor but it really was a real highlight like everyone i met everyone from the, the taxi driver that picked me up from the station to everyone on set the crew you know the people who worked at the hotel it's like it was the most friendliest place I'd ever visited. And I'm from a place which everyone, when you go to Cyprus, everyone goes, oh, the locals are always so friendly. And But I tell you, that, that was one of the, the highlights is just how welcoming everyone was and, and how amazing, how amazingly warm all the, all the everyone in Belfast was. We just had the, the best time, the it's- best time. It's really nice from someone. I'm not actually from Belfast. I'm from a place called Derry, but like Northern Ireland's that small. I mean, I, pretty much all the people are the same, you know. Um, there's one thing. It's really nice to hear that because you know, just the, the cast and crew and everybody felt so welcome. And I've heard it a lot before, um, but it's just really nice to hear it again. You know that you, you were welcomed here into this country. It's fantastic, you know. Yeah, it was amazing, and I and I had such a great time, and mm-hmm. and uh, the place where we stayed, uh, which was right by the Europa, um, 
and you know the great thing was is that we had time off we weren't always working every single day because of how the units were so mm. we had time to go and explore yeah and that was great because half the time you go you go and film somewhere anywhere in the world and you're literally there and then you leave and you don't get a chance to spend any time but because we filmed it over the summer and i'd come backwards and come back and forth and then my filming had you know a few days i had to obviously learn choreography as well so so i really had the time to actually go and explore and really get to to, to, mm -hmm. to and also go to a lot of the history of the city you know and 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 just get to see places that you'd only ever heard about you know and that, that was a real highlight too awesome brilliant and you just mentioned the choreography there the from doing screen from like training a little bit in screen combat um and actually implementing a camera and to make sure it's done right and even in training it was very, very difficult with angles and making sure that things were looking like they were connecting and stuff like that. I mean, the scenes that you do in Game of Thrones are very, very choreographed and stylized. Yeah. How much preparation went on the into like a one of your pieces of choreography? How long would that have taken? So, what I ended up doing is that when I got the part, I, I immediately asked my agent to get in touch with HBO and say, I really wanted someone to help me, like get me a choreographer to, to pick up the water dance, what the vocabulary would be like. Um, and beyond my wildest dreams, they got me uh, William Hobbs, who unfortunately died last year. Um, uh, he was my Sirio Pharrell. He was my mentor when it came to learning those, that just the style. And he is a man who has worked with everyone on film when it comes to period sword fighting. Uh, he, he worked on The Duelists with Ridley Scott uh, in the 70s, which is a fantastic, I mean, the, the sword play of that. <clears throat> and so he was really interested in coming at the, the, the movement from the character point of view. So I was always interested in what the moves were going to be. And he said, he would always tell me to slow down and say, all I need to know is who is this character? I need you to do the research, find out everything you can possibly, you know, obviously using your imagination, but we got the source of the, the books to, to, to tell us a lot. So, so um, and of course, what we discover as is the most common sense idea of any great teacher is that those who are the masters do the very the the, the the least right yeah it's all about you know it's always the ones who overcompensate who aren't very good and so yeah. immediately i was disappointed because he was like so if you want to be bouncing off the walls that's not going to happen right because <laughs> he's far <laughs> too good to do that yeah. he can make you fall over with just a flick of his wrist right that's that's what he's going to be like and so he taught me a lot of great uh lessons to, to how to approach you know the, the character and cooked up this but we we cooked up the vocabulary of what the style would be and then when i got to and i so i spent about two weeks with him and Maisie stunt double because Maisie was already prepping in northern ireland um and so i went to northern ireland and taught her what i'd been taught because bill didn't come with me and then we worked we worked with buster reeves who was our fight coordinator and he was the one who actually created the fights and um and and that's how we how we did it. So it was in stages. We I came up with a style with with Bill, and then and then Buster would turn that into moves. And then and then you know it was then it was about me and Maisie just doing it because we didn't use our stunt doubles. It was just us on screen. We we did it all ourselves. And so so um, it was a, a you know a mixture of all of those things. And then there's a, a few kind of crazy things that happen. For example, when we were f filming the very first lesson, there's one move that I do where I'm demonstrating the weight of the sword and mm -hmm. I flip it and I catch it on the back of my hand. And I had never done that before. I ha we hadn't even thought of doing it. I thought in my head when we were rehearsing the scene, wouldn't it be great if I could flip it over and catch it, balance it on the back of my hand? Uh, that's all that I'd done. I'd never practiced it, never rehearsed it, nothing. I just thought about it, right? Mm -hmm. But because we were so in the zone, at least this is the way I, I remember it, I, as we were doing the scene, I just 
for no unno for an unro ungodly reason I decided to try it. It wasn't like a decision. I was yeah. just in the moment. I was kind of carried away by uh by 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 you know being in, in the moment and I did it. Yeah. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see Buster and all the crew who had been working on the choreography with me yeah. literally go, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> and yeah. it almost put me off. And luckily I carried on. I'm a yeah. terrible corpser. So, so I managed to get through it and they kept it. And so, um, uh, you know, little magic things like that happened. And, but that's all testament testimony to the people I worked with because they get they imbued me with so much confidence that I actually felt like I could really do that yeah you know what I mean it's, and so uh, half the time it is purely psychological that stuff you know yeah I'm gonna actually we worked hard you know we'd worked I'm... really hard we'd really drilled it so yeah man by the way it plays on camera it's just especially with uh, your fight between the Kingsguard and uh, Meryn Trant and the Lannisters, how swish that is, how well it looks, you know, just um, without being overly flashy at the same time, you know. I'm actually going to go back and look at that bit in the show where you flip the sword just to see if there's any any <laughs> the you look at over at Buster and freaking out. I'm just here it is. <laughs> oh, <laughs> gotta check that out. Nice one. And of course your water dancing man, you're still doing it really. Because uh you're over Con of Thrones. Obviously um I was over there last year as well, over at Con of Thrones. It's an absolutely brilliant place to do, but you have this whole lot of thing of teaching water dancing at Con of Thrones. How long have you been doing that um, at, over uh, in America with the guys at Con of Thrones? Since I did it in Northern Ireland, there was a convention. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still going now. It's um, What's the convention in... Um, in 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 belfast titan kong uh, titan kong yeah that was the very first time uh i do believe world con and titan con happened at the same time i know it happened last year but it happened uh 10 years ago as well we just shot the first season uh uniquely me Maisie, and sophie turner were at the convention um george r martin was there as well i mean it was like bonkers the kind of thing that you would never get all of those people in the same room ever again but yeah that that was that was really exciting and i remember someone i think i i seem to remember that we were doing a panel and george r r martin kind of challenged me to do a work a, a class and okay. I, of course, said no, because I'm not a teacher. And I was like, no. And of course, everyone was like, yes, you've got to do a class. You've got to do a class. And so they bullied me into doing a class. And I kind of, you know, bluffed it. <laughs> I bluffed it with what I've learned over the years, you know, fight choreography. People really liked it. Oh, yeah. And I thought to myself, well, Pierce, you know, obviously, then I got asked to do it again. I was very reluctant because I, you know, I'm not a tea. I don't, I'm not like a, I'm not a, you know, don't, I'm not a dojo master, right? I don't, you know, it's not something I do regularly, but I found a way of doing conventions where I didn't have to sit behind a desk and just sign autographs all day long. Yes. I found a way of being able to do something interactive and, um, and I put some effort in and I started doing some research and I kind of came up with this idea of trying to look at um, the stuff you see on TV and film as far as fight choreography and trying to relate it to what the reality of dueling would have been okay. historically mm -hmm. and going what's similar and what is different and uh, finding the places in Game of Thrones because it, it's a great example of showing um, how the reality of fighting, like the very first fight you see that Bronn does um, at the Eyrie yes. with the knight, you know, it's a great example of, 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 of busting the myths of what it is to be a great swordsman. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. you, know you did not fight with honour. Yeah, but he did. <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh. The guy was dead. So, 
so yeah. so that stuff I think is really good and, and Game of Thrones did it very very well so that was my mm -hmm. starting point and so over the years I've kind of just created something that um, anyone can do you know I spend between an hour and 90 minutes and I kind of teach people how to improvise their own fights and I only give them like a very limited set of moves mm -hmm. uh, and just it's all about for me it's all about um you know physical presence and how two people kind of it's a dance that's kind of how i approach it you know the choreography is about how two people find a way to read each other and mm -hmm. be able to fight in a way that keeps you safe but also feels like it's it's uh, improvised because it is improvised it's about yeah. it's about how you you are present mm -hmm. and uh, and about the discipline of 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 not showing off yeah um, being, right. being disciplined and so so in an hour and a half you can kind of teach people quite a lot of stuff that you they can then go on to to pursue you know mm. and so, so I, I've, I've really enjoyed it i've really enjoyed it and, and i feel like i uh, they've grown yeah and it is it's really good because yeah there's that something extra than just sitting there and signing autographs over and over again like you know it's you're bringing something else to the convention as well i mean like whenever whenever we were over um your classes were chocolate they were sold out you know what i mean so it's just great now because there is gonna be pretty much no con of thrones 2020 um would you would you would you be talked into doing a water dancing class over zoom yeah i am thinking about it as, yeah. as even as I, I i something i wanted to do uh for ages but yeah i'm thinking of it's something i've been kind of uh cooking up in my head about how i would do it i definitely would be up for it yeah mm -hmm. awesome man well like if, i think if you mentioned it then the the anybody a con of thrones that would spread quite literally like wildfire no i think i think it would i'm i'm, I'm the, what all i just wanted i need to do is really figure out a way that i can actually because either i what i do is i just do a class that isn't interactive it's literally i would just put an hour of me starting at the beginning and doing it as if i've got people in front of me yeah or is there a is there a more interactive way of doing it whereby you have people on zoom that you can hear in your in your in your headpiece mm -hmm. so but i wouldn't obviously i wouldn't want to kind of be looking at, at, at the screens but what i could do is hear people commenting and asking questions and mm -hmm. i could then do a demonstration of things that they're asking about so oh. so at the moment i'm i'm not sh quite sure what's the best way of doing it but yeah i i something i've wanted to do for a while actually because people always ask me especially when people who don't manage to get to places where i'm doing uh those lessons always say to me is there any way that you can do it can you know can you you know is there a way you can do it on skype and and uh, i if i can find a way to mm -hmm. make it uh so it's valuable so it isn't just me prancing around in front of the camera humiliating yeah. myself but that is valuable that it is an interactive thing quality to it then then i'm i'm definitely up for it yeah brilliant man awesome hey well i, I think you can you would be able to do something like that today so best of luck and, and setting that up and stuff and let me know as well whenever yeah. that went down that would be Don't awesome worry. uh i'm sure you'd be in, uh announcing stuff like that on instagram would you like yeah on, instagram and i've got a facebook page yeah What's your Instagram, man? We'll get it up on screen there. Uh, Mr. Atlantis. Follow Mel Mel Meltos on that, guys. M-R-A-T-L-A-N-T-I-S. Awesome. And, and then I'm, uh, at, yeah, at, yeah, at that. Um, that's on Instagram and uh, Miltos Yorlamo on Twitter and uh, M Yorlamo. I think I've got a Facebook actor page where you'll find all my convention stuff posted and stuff. Oh, some I'm a bit rubbish at so social media, but I have got better since we've been in quarantine, seeing as there's nothing else to do. So just give you a stage and a script, not a not, not a social media platform. I know it's wild. So Mel Post, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been brilliant. Thank you. It's, it's been, it's been great. so good to catch up with you. Yeah, it's oh, really man. good. I'm very really, very happy. Really good. And as usual, Bobby's going to display uh, it on the screen and a picture. 
um, we have our wolf and the, the wolf and the crow sticker that we like to offer everybody man so we're going to get your address and we're going to wing one over to you all right thank so you, you. Have a, a, a way of thanks a wolf and the crows sticker um on i can see it just in the corner here and it looks that's awesome what, so i really want one that's what it looks like now, you're getting one you are definitely getting one um, Excellent. no matter what we will find if we have found people have said yeah we'll take a sticker and then they haven't followed up <laughs> i've got them that sticker okay <laughs> Awesome. Um, guys, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe uh, to this video and share it as much as possible. Uh, Meltos, thank you very much for coming on. An absolute honor to talk to you, man. Um, so, guys, like, share, and subscribe. In, uh, write in the comments below your favorite Meltos moment from Game of Thrones, if you, so if you would be so kind. And guys, we'll see you next time. Big thank you, Miltos. And as always, guys, the North remembers. See you next time. <laughs> What's your name, Pretty good interview, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, he's, he's, a, he's a sound guy, Miltos. Like. Lovely. Yeah, lovely chap. Even before, you see, guys, you get to see, you know, what, what we, we want you to see. But even before, like, we officially started the interview, uh, I was chatting to Miltos and it was just such, it was my real first time speaking with him and it was just so nice to find out that he was a fucking lovely guy, not to yeah. mention a fucking brilliant actor. So fantastic, yeah. Uh, so, you, you can actually check out that extended, um, unedited uh, interview with the, uh, yeah. the bit before with Andy chatting to him for about 10-15 minutes over on the Patreon. Yeah. So we head over to the Patreon and you can check that out over there. Yeah, big time. Hey. Do you know Bobby of anywhere doing rewatches of Game of Thrones with a live stream every Wednesday and Sunday at seven o'clock? Do you know where people could go for that? But the, the sort of thing where like they're interactive with the with the viewers, yeah, that, that, that sort of thing, an interactive discussion with two guys that were actually in Game of Thrones. Do you know where they could go for that? Um, actually, over on the channel every Wednesday and Sunday at seven p.m. GMT. You can check that out. Girl. Yeah. Oh fuck. Oh, and actually, tomorrow night, tomorrow night we start season two on our rewatches. Yeah. yeah. Episode oh, one man. of season two. Kick ass. We're in the season two already. Fuck me, um, class. Um, guys, stay. Join us for that. Fucking, as always, join us for that. Like, share, and subscribe to this video. Fucking, um, and we'll be coming at you with more brilliant interviews like the one we just had there with Maltos. Absolutely fucking fantastic. We're really looking forward, really excited to bring you more and more from um, the people that helped make the world's biggest and greatest television show. So we'll talk yep. rock and roll. From all, the, from all different departments as well. Yes. Not just, not just the actors. Everybody that went into the blood, sweat, and tears of making the show. Blood, sweat, and beards. Big time. Now, um with with that i think there's only guys join us next time for more right but you stay safe you stay fucking social distance and guys we will fucking see you next time okay bobby if you'd like to sign out for the watch the noise remembers Ch -ch -ch.